Welcome to the T-16 video series on radiation. In this video, we'll be discussing different types of radiation effects. When you think about radiation, there are different exposure dependencies. The first is time dependent, and it's referred to as dose effects, aka the longer a system is exposed, the higher accumulation of radiation that system will see. This accumulation is represented by two terms, total ionizing dose and displacement damage dose. The second type of radiation is grouped under the term single event effects, which are caused by random, heavy ions impacting the silicon. While very rare, they have negatively impacted a number of space missions. Think of this as an atomic scale cannonball that blasts through the material and can create either destructive or non-destructive effects. The single event effects topics will be covered in later videos. So looking at TID a bit deeper, Ionizing radiation can charge dielectrics, such as oxide or nitride, which can result in traps in that dielectric. Radiation can also change surface states at the oxide-silicon interface, which can lead to increased leakage. This causes a rise in both supply and bias current, which can impact a number of attributes, such as offset voltage and response time, and under longer exposure can cause a device to become non-functional. For bipolar transistors, TID effects can be worse at low dose rate, but for CMOS transistors, HDR is typically the worst case environment. For a TID exposure, kilorads is the most common term used for expressing radiation damage in electronics. RAD stands for radiation absorbed dose. The medical community tends to use gray as a radiation unit, which is an international standard unit, one gray equals 100 rad. One possible mitigation approach to these dose-dependent effects is to use shielding to protect the sensitive circuitry from radiation. The chart on the right provides an example of using different thicknesses of aluminum shielding on a LEO mission profile. As you can see, shielding does reduce the exposure, but is not a 100% mitigation approach. The historic standard radiation test was an accelerated test done at high dose rate over a relatively short time period. For example, at 300 rads per second, it takes less than 6 minutes to reach 100 K rad. But in space, a system can take up to 10 years to reach 100 K rad. It was discovered that some bipolar products degrade more at low dose rate than they do at high dose rate. And sometimes even, even the worst case is when the devices are tested in a non-biased state instead of being biased, aka powered up. So in response, the industry defined a new test term, ELDERS, for enhanced low dose rate sensitivity. In the plot on the right, I'm showing the drift of a reference versus radiation. Uh, the blue lines are when the parts are irradiated at high dose, and the red lines are when the part is irradiated at low dose. It can be seen that from this product, it's worst at a low dose rate, and thus the part has elders. Components with bipolar transistors should be characterized for elders. To do the characterization, some units are irradiated at high dose and others at low dose, and the results are compared. If the drift at low dose is more than the high dose, the part is said to have elders, and the radiation lot acceptance test, RLAT testing, must be done at low dose rate. If the product does not show significant difference, the part is considered elders free, and the RLAT testing can be done either at high dose rate or low dose rate, depending on how the supplier approaches the problem. To expand on this point, I pulled these three images from our radiation handbook for different bipolar devices. And as you can see, for the specified datasheet parameter on the x-axis, the chart highlights how much the spec varies over different radiation dose rates and exposure time. This clearly highlights the importance of understanding the underlying details of the radiation report, specifically for bipolar parts. We have talked a fair amount about TID. Now I want to move on to another dose-dependent effect, which is displacement damage. And it is created when protrons strike a silicon atom and knock it out of place. This causes traps in the silicon, which can tie up carriers and can lead to increased leakage in the part. A device's susceptibility to displacement damage is dependent upon the device's silicon feature size, active junction depths, and process technology. Some bipolar parts are very sensitive to displacement damage, 
and can fail when they see proton strikes of 10 to the 12th protons per square centimeter or less. CMOS parts tend to survive much greater fluences of protons and sometimes survive 10 to the 13th protons per centimeter squared or more. Many space programs that have displacement dose requirements do not even bother to test the CMOS parts. The test methodology for displacement damage is to expose units in an unbiased state in a nuclear reactor. They are irradiated and sometimes they become radioactive, so it is necessary to wait for them to cool down before the parts can be electrically retested. Neutrons are used instead of protons in doing displacement damage testing because protons also have total ionizing dose effect. The neutrons are used so the displacement damage can be separated out from the effects of TID. In some testing, a product will go through displacement damage and then will be followed with total ionizing dose testing to see the cumulative effect of displacement damage and TID on that single piece of silicon. For more information on how radiation can affect electronics, please see TI's Radiation Handbook. Thank you for listening to this video, and please watch the next video to learn more about destructive single event effects.